So if you want to this morning, grab a copy of the Word of God and find us in Exodus chapter 15. In Exodus chapter 15, we're going to read um, an account of the children of Israel coming out of the Red Sea. We just went over that last Sunday. And here, we're about to hear them sing a song. They're on the other side. They've made it out. I'm in your notes and in your text. I think it says begin around verse 22. That is sort of where the sermon starts. But I want to sort of back up, if you will. So that's why it's important you have a Bible. Some of these verses may not be on the screen. But I actually want to back up and go to Exodus chapter 15. I want to start at verse 19. So just three verses uh, before um, we actually start the text. And you see the title of the message this morning. Here it is, Bitter Blessings. That is appropriately titled for the text. Obviously, the text gives us the title. As always, we try our best to let the Word of God drive the lessons instead of our creativity drive that. And so obviously, that is written right here in the text. Here's what you need to know this morning. Just because life may be full of troubles does not mean that it's out of God's hand. Let that sit for just a moment. Right now in our family, our church family, in the last two weeks, uh, we have had two families that have experienced the death of adult children. Uh, we are watching folks that are receiving diagnosis of cancer. That are, they're in the middle of treatment of cancer. Others are coming out of and are still following protocols to keep cancer at bay. We know folks are losing their jobs. We know that Folks are struggling in marriages and relationships and life in general. We know folks are still trying to keep addictions behind them. Like right now in our church family, there appropriately, if you will, there are bitter blessings where they're witnessing and watching the hand of God move, but at the same time, life is full of some bitterness. And it causes all of us to pause and just say, God, things aren't supposed to be this way. I thought that following you meant that I sort of knew this would happen, but I didn't think it would happen like this. Anybody ever been there? Job cries out, and he tells us this. He says, man born of woman will face troubles in this world. The New Testament tells us that the rain falls on the just and the unjust. That no matter if we are a follower of Christ and a devout follower of Christ, or whether someone is far from God, nonetheless, the Bible tells all of us we'll experience bitter moments in life. So remember this, please, as we get deep into this text if things are full of trouble right now, it does not mean they are out of God's hand. It might just mean that you were led there by the providence of God. But it might mean, as we're going to see here, because of their attitude in the midst of really what just happened and is about to happen, they chose to mumble, they chose to grumble, they chose to complain and murmur. And in that, God took advantage of that and chose to teach them a valuable lesson which would lead them all the way through the rest of their journey, which for you and I follows us as well. So we're in the text this morning, Exodus chapter 15. I want to begin at verse 19 and watch the stark contrast from literally what I would call Sunday morning worship in verse 19, 20, and 21, and then the lack of Monday morning faith, if you will, uh, on just three days later. Watch this, verse 19. For when the horses of Pharaoh with his chariots and his horsemen went into the sea, the Lord brought back the waters of the sea upon them, but the people of Israel walked on dry ground in the midst of the sea. Now watch this. Then Miriam, the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a tambourine in her hand, and all the women went out with their tambourines and dancing, and Miriam, Miriam sang to them, Sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. Now, if you'll back up, we have what's called the Song of Moses. So literally right here, you have two songs that were sung. So hang on. Two songs. Like they literally just watched the entire Egyptian army drown right in front. Like the last person, like the last boot, if you will, that left dry ground, God closed up the sea and drowned every one of them right in front of their eyes. What a phenomenal event that would have been. And they break out into song. They sing the Song of Moses where they sing the praise of the leader Miriam here now begins to sing the praise of God is what's to happen. Now watch verse 22. Then Moses made Israel set out from the Red Sea, and they went into the what? Other words known as the desert of Shur. They went how many days? So Sunday morning they were singing to God. By Wednesday they were kicking the tires of the car. They went three days into the wilderness and found no water. 
When they came to Marah, they could not drink the water of Marah because it was bitter. Therefore, it was named Marah. And the people grumbled against Moses. The guy they just wrote a song about three days ago. They're like, who is this guy? Right? Listen to me. And, and, and they cried, a sang a song to Moses, what shall we drink? Now, here's what Moses did. And here is the sermon. Like, literally, the sermon is almost in one verse. Verse 25. And he cried, underline that, he cried. He cried to the Lord. And the Lord showed him, underline that, the Lord showed him a log, a branch, or a tree. And he threw it into the water, and the water became sweet. There the Lord made for them a statute and a rule. If you don't underline that, you need to say that about eight times. And there he tested them. You should underline that. Saying, if you will diligently listen to the voice of the Lord your God and do that which is right in his eyes and give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you that I put on the Egyptians. For I am the Lord, your healer. Oh, they're going to need to hear those words again and remember those words when they need to hear them. But watch verse 27. Then they came to Elam where 12, there were 12 springs of water and 70 palm trees, and they encamped there by the water. Remember Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 2. We gave you this verse last week, and it was also transitional to this week. And you shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might humble you, testing you to know what is in your heart whether you would keep his commandments or not. Do you think it was out of God's foresight that he knew they would run into a, uh, the, the first available spot of water that would be undrinkable? Even though things felt like it was full of trouble, it was not out of God's hand. Even though they just sang a song and watched God deliver them from the Red Sea, now they're obviously, I mean, rightly so, let's, let's, be, let's be honest, rightly so, they're looking for water because they're in the wilderness. They're, they're in the desert. They're in a place where we're talking about, where they don't see the supply. And so now they're asking like, Moses, why did you lead us here? What do we need to know? Deserts always test the heart. I'm going to preach this theme for at least three sermons. So maybe next Sunday and maybe the next. Maybe three to four sermons because you need to get this. Deserts test the heart. Why? If you follow the Lord, please understand this. If you follow the Lord, then you're going to find that your life will be one where you're going to have moments of detours, dead ends, and dry holes because you're walking in the Spirit. Did you hear that? Now, yes, there are going to be times when God puts us on a detour because of disobedience. When God allows us in our thinking, we, He will allow us to follow our own line of thinking. He will allow us to sort of manage life with our own hands and let us run to an end, if you will, because we're, we're taking it in our own self, in our own hands. But there's going to be times when there are detours, when there are dead ends and there are dry holes. There are detours in life because you're walking there led by the Spirit of God. God knew this well was there, that this body of water was there. He knew it was undrinkable to them, but he's still trying to build a dependence upon them. Listen, for what he knows is about to come. He literally, he literally watched, he literally allowed them to witness him parting the Red Sea. Like, here's a God that will do a lot of things with water, right? Like, if, if our God can do that with a massive body of water, what can he do with this one? That should have been their response. But are we not the same way? God will come in and do something miraculous. And then often it just takes the smallest stream of water to simply derail our faith. Listen, don't act pious and don't act religious. I mean, I'm not saying you are, but learn from me. I'm just like that. I will watch God move on Sunday and then I can be full of fear on Monday. You're the same way. You and I are the same way. Why does God allow that to happen? Because he knows what's coming days ahead of us. So he allowed another body of water to teach a lesson to the children of Israel. But here, here's what we know. Israel failed that test. Israel absolutely failed that test. That's amazing to me. I mean, they literally sang a song. They, they'd just come through the Red Sea like, I watch God do amazing things during the week. And I watch him do amazing things in families' lives. Like, I literally have a front row seat to watching God move in hundreds, if not thousands of people's lives. Like, I, I have a front row seat to see that. And yet, when certain things happen to me, I as well doubt. But I honestly have to think, like, if I witnessed God build a super highway 
through an ocean. Two million people had to go through it. It wasn't as wide as this building. Two million people had to go through the Red Sea. God built a super highway through an ocean on dry ground. It wasn't mushy. I have to tell this story. Raina's going to laugh. We went kayaking through the mangroves recently. I knew she would laugh. And I saw a guide stand up, and I thought, okay, I've been seated for a while. I'm going to stand where she stood. Wait. You are, yeah, okay. I get out, and I'm thinking I'm at the Rakaiva River, not down by the ocean. I'm thinking I can stand on this body of sand. I get out, flip flop, flip flops, and all. And immediately my foot sinks down about a foot and a half. And I just about can't get my, my foot out, right? And I'm rocking the boat. Randa's about to fall in. She's like, what are you doing? You know, and so forth. And then all of a sudden, something bit my toe. I don't know what it was. I was like, you ever seen that video of the dog that gets in? He's in the ocean. He comes out like three feet. I came out three feet and landed in that kayak. That was one small little body of water, and I freaked out, right? That's my point in all that. Are we not the same way? We literally will watch God build a super highway in our life. In the next moment, one little body of water, and it causes you and I to panic. That's the whole story that, that we're learning here. Israel just sang a song. They literally watched an entire army. All of their fears, all of their fears of the past were drowned. And here they are in front of one body of water, and they're like, what are we going to drink? Just three days after the Red Sea experience, we hear them murmuring. The Bible uses the word grumbling and complaining. Let me give you a desert lesson right now. Here's one of the lessons that God's trying to teach them, and he does it early on. So this isn't the main lesson. This is kind of, if I can say it this way, kind of like an appetizer before the lesson. So God allows them to grumble. He puts them in a spot just to see what's going to come out of their mouth, like what kind of attitude they're going to have so he can teach them a lesson, which is why later you're going to hear the words, he taught them a statute, like he gave them a command that they would never forget, a decree, a law, sort of like a universal law like gravity. He goes, if you obey me, things will go well. If you grumble against me, it's not going to go well. So he uses this instance to teach them that. Why is murmuring so bad? Murmuring is a great sin. Did you know that? The Bible tells you and I that the very breath you have is given to you by God. When you murmur, gossip, complain, critique, you're not complaining against that person. You're not even complaining against your pastor. You're not even complaining against your wife. You're not even complaining against your neighbor. When you murmur, the Bible says you're using the very breath of God to complain against God. Listen to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I'm going to jump down to verse 7. Do not be idolaters as some of them were as it is written. The people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. We must not indulge and listen, sexual immorality as some did. 23,000 fell in a single day, right? We must not put Christ, listen, this is the, he's referencing, if you're listening, he's about to reference Sodom and Gomorrah. Now he's about to reference what happened in this passage. Like 1 Corinthians 10 is now using this, which is why I told you 1 Corinthians 10 is the chapter that basically says these things, the Old Testament, these things happen so that you and I might learn from them. This is one of those texts. Listen to what he says now. We must not put Christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by the serpents nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of ages has come. The Bible says, therefore, let no one, let anyone think that he stands, take heed lest he fall. No temptation has taken you that is common to man. God is faithful. He will not let you be attempted beyond ability, but within temptation will also provide a way of, of escape. The Bible literally just listed gossip in the same realm as Sodom and Gomorrah. The Bible just listed gossiping, murmuring, complaining in the same realm as sexual idolatry, as murder. Like you think right at that moment, you're choosing to, hey, can I, can I, can I share a prayer request with you? Like, I don't know if you know this about them. I don't know if you know what's going on. Like, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but At that moment when you're choosing to use your breath like that, you're not murmuring and complaining against the situation or the person. The Bible says you're using it to complain against God. Here is today's truth. Where you are is by design. To prove you, to test you, your desert is God's proving ground. God actually wanted to elicit that response out of them 
so he could step into their life and say, this type of attitude is not going to get you far where you're about to go. If you continue to mumble and grumble and complain, like what did they do? One minute they sing a song about Moses. The next minute they're like complaining to him, why did you lead us out here to die? Why did you lead us into a place where there is no water? Now, thankfully, we don't have a church that grumbles and mumbles and complains. But to be fair, every once in a while, I'll hear people say stuff, right? Like, why do we do it this way? Why do we do it this way? Why is there not more things for senior adults? Why is there not enough things for these moms? Why is there not enough things for these things? Why are there not enough for this for that? Why? And I get the heart of some of those requests. You and I need to be very careful. Just listen to me right now as your pastor. You and I need to be very careful of all the little text texting we do, the little chats that we might have, the little telephone. I call it the telephone ministry, right? Where you get on the phone, you talk to so-and-so. You and I need to be very careful about what comes out of our mouth in this season of life for our church. Because where God is greatly moving and God is using every instance to teach our church a valuable lesson, make no mistake about it, we may have just raised some money to build a building. God is not so much concerned about raising money to raise a building. He's concerned about raising a people who are filled with him when they occupy the building. It will do none of us any good to fill a building with empty people. We need to fill a building with filled people. And God's going to use every instance in this journey for you and I to teach us the same lesson that he's about to teach them. What are the desert lessons? Number one, here it is. The desert is designed to highlight, listen, the fickle and the fragile parts of our faith. Why did God lead them into the desert? He knows the battles they're about to face. And why he's doing this is he's choosing that in that moment to test what's down in us, like literally pull it out of us so that we can see it, so that we can hear it, so that we can know it, we can feel it, we can smell it, and God can speak to that. Before it ever comes out of our life, you and I are prone to say things like this. Oh, I'll never respond that way. Oh, that won't be me. When I go through that, oh, I'll pass that test with flying colors. We may not say that out loud, but we feel some sort of self-dependency, self-trust in our life, oh, oh, I would never do that. I, don't, I can't believe they responded that way. God uses these illustrations, these moments, to pull out of us what does not need to be in us because when we go to battle with that fickle faith, we're going to fall immediately. And why has God put us in the wilderness to highlight what is fickle and what is fragile? The Israelites needed to trust God to part the waters. Now, listen, they must trust him to provide water. Is that not going to be you and I? You and I are always going to be brought to where, God, there's a body of water in front of me. I need you to part it. But there's also going to be a body of water that when you and I first look at it, we're like, what do I do with that? Like, God, what do I do with this job that you've given me? What do I do with this relationship? What do I do with this circumstance? God, what do I do with what's happening right now? And when you and I look at it, that causes us to experience bitterness, if you will. Like, what am I to do with that comment? What am I to do with this situation? Like, God, I know you're an amazing God because I've seen what you've done. But right now, this causes me bitterness. He's doing that for a purpose and for a reason. Why? We need to trust God for deliverance from bondage, Egypt, and the obstacles to faith, the Red Sea, as much as we need to trust him for provision, sweet water, in the burdens, no water of life. So often, we only want to trust God for the mountaintop experiences. But it might just be those little streams along the way that cross our path that God wants to use because he knows what's coming down the road. Just because things seem full of trouble right now does not mean they're out of God's hand. It might just be that God is directing you there, guiding you there, because he knows what body of water is next. So you cannot just trust him to part them, but to provide them. You ready for the message? We just now jumped into it. How do we turn bitterness into blessing then? Obviously, when things, things are going to happen in life that cause us bitterness, how do we turn that bitterness into blessing? I want to show you three things God used in this, and I want to show you three responses, lessons that Israel had that, that they needed to learn that you and I need to learn. Number one, trust God's guidance. God brought them there. We already heard that. That, that lesson didn't just apply to the Red Sea. Like literally Moses, the Bible says, Moses made them get up and go. Why did he do that? Because God said, Moses, get the people up. Moses came down and said, we got to go here. It would have been so easy to rest right by that shore. 
and stay right there at that moment and say, look what God did. But they needed to move on. And God made them move on. God is going to continually ask you to move out of your comfort zone. God is going to continually ask, ask you to follow him in steps of faith. And yes, you may not know where you're going. But the Bible tells you and I, they had to absolutely trust the guidance of God. So they grumble and they complain. We heard that. What does Moses do? Back down to verse 25. And he cried to the Lord. So in other words, Moses felt both pains. Now this word cried to the Lord means he literally cried out in prayer. So Moses once again is expressing what we've always heard him express. Like insecurity in himself. Insecurity of sort of the people but security in God. And so he said, God, I want my insecurity to meet your security. So God, I'm crying out. Like in other words, he's saying, they have a legitimate request. Like I get what's going on right now. Like God, I don't, I don't know what to do next. Do I like it that they sang a song to me one day and now they're, they're singing the death of me now? No, I absolutely don't. So you hear all of that in his voice. He's like, this wasn't my fault. But yet I'm being blamed for it because you brought me here. So God, I'm bringing all this. I need my security in you to meet my insecurity of the situation. What is the number one lesson? Pray instead of pout. Believe and not doubt. What is the first thing? Listen, Moses may, may have been a, a leader with weaknesses like all of us. But the one thing we see happen every time Moses was challenged, he went to God in prayer first. It is the first thing that Moses did. When you and I don't understand the guidance of God, when we don't see his, his hand, but we, we, we can feel his heart, like, Lord, I don't know why you led me here. I don't know why this is happening to me right now. Like, there's so much of this that is causing me bitterness and distrust, and not just in myself, but can I admit distrust in you, God? Like, I don't get this right now. What is the first thing we should do? We should pray instead of pout. Because if you don't begin using your voice to call back out to God, you will use your voice to cry out against God. That is the first thing we see. What did the, what did the weak Israelites do in their, in their weak and, and fragile faith? They immediately complained against God and complains against the leadership of God. What did Moses do? Moses, because of the time spent with God up to this point, Moses had learned, I need to go right to God. I need to go right to God. Moses is actually exhibiting good leadership right here. When the people were saying, Lord, we don't know what's going on, he goes, I'm going to go back to God. God told me to go here, so I'm going to go back to him. That is what you and I need to do. You and I have to pray instead of pout. What was the lesson he's learning here? The power of prayer. The power of prayer. I'm telling you right now, I can remember the moment I was at a pastor's conference, and I've shared it with you before. I was maybe 25 years old, and I, I heard pastors now my age stand up and say, prayer has to be a vital part of your ministry. And honestly, in my mind, I'm thinking, ah, that's just because you're old, you know? I mean, I, I, can, I literally can remember thinking that. I was like, no, nah, man, I'm young and 25. Let's go. Let's ride this bull. Let's do this thing. Like, I'm ready to follow God. Like, that was literally my mindset. Like, let's go. Let's go. I have learned over the years, prayer is the greatest thing you will ever do. If you don't do anything, pray. If anything that you ever do, pray. Like you need to stop and pray. You can pray continually. And you can pray constantly. You can pray wherever you're at, no matter what you're doing. But I'm telling you right now, you have to entertain the host of heaven and go to God immediately by trusting God's guidance. What do I mean by that? God, you led me here. You told me, Moses, you told me to lead the people where we are. And you have to know they're going, where is this God taking us? We're leaving the shore. We're heading into the desert. We've never been here. What do we need to do? Understand the power of prayer. When you get to a moment in your life and you made a financial commitment to the church and you're going, God, what's happened? Ever since I made a financial commitment to the church, I've never had more flat tires in my life. If all of a sudden you've recommitted your life to Christ and you in prayer, you said, God, I want to trust you. And the next thing is you get a call from your doctor that says, hey, do you mind coming back and revisiting the test results we just had? He said, God, I'm going to trust you with my job, and I'm going to change my attitude. As soon as you change your attitude, you go in for an assessment by your boss or your management, and they're like, hey, some things need to change. You're like, God, I just trusted you with my attitude. I just trusted you with my finances. The very first thing you do when God leads you from the Red Sea out into the wilderness is you must, we must be people of prayer. Prayer is the only thing that ever fights our battles. It is what enables our hands. It is what empowers our heart. It is what enables our belief when we can't see. We have to be a people of prayer. And would you not agree? Our world needs prayer. 
Our family needs prayer. Our children need prayer. Our schools need prayer. Like, we need prayer. Amen? We need to learn to pray. If God answers prayer, then the greatest thing we ought to ever do is go to God in prayer. You and I need to learn that lesson. Trust the guidance of God. Staying in verse 25, number two, look for the lesson in the journey. Look for the lesson in the journey. Jump down and read this phrase one more time. It just it stands out to you, or at least it should. Go, go halfway down through the verse, what I call part B. And it says, there the Lord made for them a statute and a rule. That is the number one thing that comes out of this. What, what God is doing is God is testing what is going to be their response. So when he sees the response that he knows they're going to give, he makes a statute and a rule. Basically, what he tells them is, here's what you need to know from now on, and it will never change, like a statute and a rule. Here's what you need to know moving forward. I am your God who is your healer. I am your God, your provider. I am your God who will lead you and direct you. You may come upon a Red Sea, and you may come upon bitter waters, but I'm the God that leads you. And all of those things, you need to absolutely trust me. When you trust me, it's going to go well. When you don't trust me, when you disobey me, and you take things into your own hands, it's not going to go well. God is using this illustration here of what's going on in their life to test them, to pull out of them what doesn't need to be a part of them, so when it does come out of them, they can see it. Maybe they don't see it. Maybe you need somebody around you to point it out. And thank the Lord for, for godly friends around you that pull that out. What is he trying to teach them? Not just the power of prayer, but listen, from this, he's trying to teach them daily dependence. They don't know this, but where they're about to go is they're about to cry out for food. And God's about to drop manna. That's next week's sermon. God's about to drop manna. And, and literally, the word man is translated, what is it? Like, they don't, we don't know, they didn't know what it was, where, right? It's, I'm explaining that next Sunday, but they don't know this. One minute they're crying out for water, the next minute they're crying out for food. They don't know this, but they complain against God about manna, and God brings them meat as far as the eye can see, as high as the eye can see. And maybe if you have a weak stomach, they eat so much of it, they throw up. God says, okay, you wanted this instead of what I provided, you got it. They needed to learn this lesson, this one little lesson at this one little body of water about bitterness. God's about to tell them, look, I'm going to take you to places. You're going to face armies. You're going to face situations. You're going to be, be, be tempted with food or the lack of. You're going to be tempted with my provision or no provision. I'm just telling you right now, I know, God says, I know what's in your heart. And in these moments, if you're not careful, if you don't pray, and if you don't daily depend on me, your heart will become bitter because of the troubles that are in your life. If you see them as full of trouble and out of my hands, then you're going to walk into trouble. And I need you to be grounded in this lesson. You and I must learn this. It's daily dependence upon God. The Bible tells us this. God gives us our daily bread, not our weekly bread. Not our monthly bread. Oh, please don't let this be the only time you get into the Word of God is on Sunday morning. Please don't let this be the only time you worship God is on Sunday morning. Please don't let this be the only time you hear from God is on Sunday morning. It's daily dependence. You can't live off Sunday's meal until next Sunday. Don't try it. You'll grow weak. You'll turn bitter. You're, you're the, the, the frail and fat, fragile parts of your faith will be exposed in your life. Sunday is the start of the week. It's when you and I come together as a body. It's kind of like halftime in the game. And now you're getting ready to go back out on Monday morning and face the things of this world, the bitter water, the Red Seas, the, the manna, the quail. You're about to face all that the wilderness brings you and I. And God needs to know, uh, number one, you're a person of prayer. And number two, you are daily dependent upon me. Number three, what do we, how do we turn bitterness into blessings? Trust Christ. Look to Christ. Keep your eyes on Christ. No other way to say that. Finish the verse. Then the Lord made for them a statute and a rule, and he tested them, saying, if you would diligently listen to the voice of the Lord your God and do that which is right in your eyes, in his eyes, and give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you that I put on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord your God, your healer. What is he trying to teach them? Well, number one, the power of prayer. Number two, daily dependence. And number three, listen, please, listen, please, listen right now. Listen, just if you can't, all eyes and all heart on me, just listen right now. The power 
of self-distrust. So often, it is so easy for you and I to trust what comes so natural for how we respond. For some people, you talk so negatively. If somebody were to tell you you talk negatively, you wouldn't even realize you talk negatively because it's so much a part of your habit. For some people, gossip and complaining and murmuring and grumbling and, and so forth, you and us, we don't even know. For some of us, we think we pray, but do we really pray? How deep is your prayer life? What does your prayer life consist of? If 10 things were to be listed on the prayer, prayer list, if God said pray about 10 things, would nine of them only be about your needs? And how many of them will be about reflecting back to God and his provision? Like how deep is your prayer life? How daily are you actually depending upon God in every moment? You and I have to continually die to self. Jesus said it this way in Luke chapter 9, verse 23, when people are asking, well, how do we follow you? He said, if any man desires to follow me, let him take up his cross, deny himself, and follow me. Prayer has to happen every day. Dependence on Christ has to happen every day and every moment. Do you know what also has to happen every day? Dying to self. Every day when you wake up, you and I have a calendar that drives us. We have a schedule that drives us. Every one of us. Every, before you get up, I mean, just right before your feet hit the floor, you need to literally say, God, today is your day. Today is your day. I know there's a calendar out there. I know there's a schedule out there. I know there are things out there that I have to do by my job. And I know that you know those things have to happen. But I am trusting you in every area of that. Trust Christ. Look to Christ. Keep your eyes on Christ. Let's go back to the verse. The Bible tells us that how God actually answered the prayer. He tells him to throw a log or a branch into the water. And the water now became sweet. I want you to listen to this. Could that branch be symbolic of the Lord Jesus Christ? Absolutely. Listen to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. He himself bore our sins in the body on the tree. That same word that is used there can be linked back to the Hebrew word here that means branch, where Jesus is considered to be a branch of Jesse that comes out for salvation. This is Christ. The solution was Christ. That's why I said look to Christ and trust Christ. This wasn't just some random piece of wood. It was literally symbolic of the salvation of Jesus Christ who would hang on the cross. Jesus doesn't just show up in the New Testament. He's right here in the Old Testament. The Bible tells us he on the tree was what made our life now sweet in him and not bitter because of sin. What does this mean? No matter how bitter my experience, the love of God explained and expressed by the cross of Jesus Christ will sweeten every experience. They didn't even know about Christ, if you will. They didn't even know that one day there was going to be a Savior named Jesus that would come to this world and hang on a cross, but they're seeing it right there. People say, how, how, do, how did the Old Testament folks come to Christ? There wasn't a cross. Yes, there was. It's right here. It's, it's, wo it's woven all the way, all through the scriptures. What do we say? What do we mean by this? When you come to a place, listen, when you come to a place where we don't understand what's happening, there are folks right now that have just received, we were on the phone with some folks this weekend, that have just now received a, a diagnosis of cancer. We were on the phone this weekend when they thought their loved one, their adult child was on the mend and then suddenly they died. You go to the bank and the bank says you're overdrawn. You go to work and the boss says you're fired. You come home and your wife says we're done. Or some other calamity happens. You come to a place. Can we just admit it? A terrible place. A horrible place. A bitter place. And if we're not where we need to be, we will begin to complain. We will begin to murmur. We will begin to distrust. It was just a few weeks ago, someone passed away. And you've heard my story before. And the same words that were used when my mom passed away were the same words I heard when I picked up the phone. My dad's on the phone, and all of a sudden, two deacons come and grab me. You've heard the story. I pick up the phone, and my dad just cries out, she's gone, she's gone. Fast forward just a few weeks ago. I pick up the phone, and somebody literally says, she's gone, she's gone. There's going to be moments in life that take you to a horrible place. There's going to be times in life where it takes you to a bitter place. And many of our folks are there or have been there. When you come to a place where you don't understand what's happening, what do you do? 
run to the cross. I'm just telling you, run to the cross. This story of throwing in a piece of wood and to bitter water and making it sweet is so powerful, and yet it's so simple and so, so small that we often overlook it. You're going to come to places that are detours, that are dead ends, and that are dry holes. And when you do, what do you do? You run to the cross. Here these folks were, they were they're mumbling, they're, they're grumbling, they're complaining. I get it. Life's going to just sometimes just do what life does and just hurt. The Bible tells you and I that man born a woman, as I said, will experience trouble. The Bible says that the rain falls on the just and the unjust. We live in a fallen world, so that means fallen people are going to make fallen decisions. And just the fact that we live in a fallen world means things are falling, if you will, all around us. We're going to walk into some of those things, which is even more the reason why we need a Savior. And thank God, in the midst of a world of bitterness, the cross stands right in the middle to say, because of Christ, life is sweetened. If you've never sat with someone who's experienced bitterness, if you yourself have ever experienced bitterness, you need to know this lesson, the power of prayer. Daily dependence upon God. And then when you and I do come to Christ, distrust self and absolutely trust Christ. You want to end on a phenomenally high note? We should, amen. I want you to go with me and finish, finish this story. In Acts chapter 15, verse 27, did you notice this? Then they came to Elam where there were how many springs? How many tribes of Israel were there? Anybody catch it yet? Here they were complaining. And they looked at one little body of water. And they said, what are we going to do? God put them through the test. Put a statute in their life. They said the power of prayer. Daily depend. Trust me. And then just a short travel away. They didn't just have a pool that everybody shared. Each tribe had their own spring. God knew that. God knew on the other side of that. There would be 12 springs and 70 trees. They literally sat and ate pomegranates and dates by their own private spring, if you will. But here's the point. They may have eaten the palms and the dates and the pomegranates from the tree, but they weren't that far away from bitterness. And God told them, this is a lesson you're going to learn. You will walk through Mara, but on the other side is Elam. You may walk through Mara, bitterness, but on the other side is provision. You may walk through Mara, distrust, but on the other side is absolute trust in God. What Mara are you facing right now? What question in your heart and your life right now that, that the devil is posturing? Should you trust God? Did he really say? Will he come through? If he were God, why did he lead you here? You just tell him, I'm going to go to God in prayer. I'm going to daily depend upon him. And I'm going to distrust self. And I'm absolutely going to trust Christ. Because I know that from the scriptures, on the other side of Mara, bitterness is 12 springs of Elam. God will provide. God will bring rest, and God will comfort. In the midst of a world full of bitterness, there stands the cross of Christ to offer to you and I what is absolutely needed. Charles Spurgeon, in his, his uh, book, Call It the, to the Students of the College of Pastors, he said this, In every sermon, make a beeline to the cross. I've never forgotten that. You and I can give application after application and moment after moment and point after point and underline under underline but what the children of Israel are learning right now don't venture far from the cross of Christ amen look to Christ trust Christ run to Christ wherever there's a Mara there's an Elam and that's how we you and I turn bitterness into blessing it doesn't matter what you face tomorrow God already knows there's an Elam on Monday or an Elam on Tuesday or an Elam on Wednesday. 
despite that you may face Mara in the morning, you might have a spring at night. All we have to do is trust Christ. Amen? I'm just telling you, trust this pastor right now. The greatest lesson that he wants this church to learn is not that is a building going up, how are the life groups, how are the trips, how are the baptisms. What he's wanting to prove in the life of Waterstone is do we trust him? And I love it that there were 12 springs just because you and I believe in 12 stones. 12 is so symbolic throughout the Bible. That's a whole nother sermon. Don't get me started on that one. But no matter what you're going through right now, if it's Amara, trust Christ. He'll see you through. Amen.